Hello and welcome to The Journal. I'm Steve Kendall. The situation in the Ukraine with Russia's invasion has created impact that's rippled across the world. Uh, joining us to lend perspective to that situation from the BGS Department of Political Science are Dr. Mark Simone and Dr. Neil Jesse, and from Bowling Green State University's School of Media and Communications, Dr. Ellen Gorsevsky. So thank you all for being here and joining us on The Journal. Uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Obviously, we've got a topic here. We're going to spend about 25, 26 minutes on it. It has a lot more than that, but uh, maybe we can illuminate some of the problems and some of the issues that people are dealing with is on the news every night. So, uh, Neil, talk about how we got here. Why are we here at this point in time with Ukraine and Russia? Well, it's a pretty complicated situation, but I'll, I'll try and boil it down to what's happened in the last few decades. Okay. Um, with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, there was a breakup of the 15 Soviet Socialist Republics. Ukraine was one of those. Uh, became independent, as did Baltic nations and nations in Central Asia. Uh, with the reorganization of the Russian Federation and Putin coming to power in 2000, uh, he has slowly but surely tried to unify Russia. Um, mm. He's tried to stabilize Russia. He's tried to build their economy back. Part of this has been dominating the neighbors, neighboring countries, mm -hmm. right? Trying to ensure that countries near him have friendly foreign policies to Russia. Uh, and so, you know, Ukraine uh, is an important nation to Russia. It's where they transport energy through to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it, they think of it as a buffer state, as a barrier state to Western uh, aggression. And so, since, since 2000, uh, you know, Putin ended the, the wars in Chechnya uh, mm -hmm. with direct military intervention. Right. Uh, in 2008, he invaded Georgia uh, and over a separatist issue in, in, in the mm -hmm. Republic of Georgia through direct military aggression. Ah. Um, <laughs> in 2014, uh, in when, there, when it appeared to Putin that Ukraine would take a more pro-Western stance, and in particular try to integrate more with the European Union, um, he solve the problem through direct military aggression yeah, uh, in which in special there's a trend developing yes, in, in, pattern here right, in in right. special in mm. a military special operation they they took crimea they seized the, the mm. peninsula of crimea uh, they uh, encouraged separatists in the donbas region the problem was is that it both went well and didn't go well in okay. 2014 mm -hmm. the seizure of crimea was simple um, it led to a referendum in which crimea decided to be part of the russian federation mm. even though not recognized by the international community uh, in the Donbass region, though, it stalled. Mm -hmm. the, the rebels there, or let's, the separatists, mm -hmm. were incapable of establishing a pseudo-state there. They were incapable of fully, in, you know, making it independent from Ukraine. Uh, and so Putin has been stuck since 2014 in a bad situation in which Russia has been supporting the separatists in Ukraine, fighting a long war against Ukraine while technically not fighting a war with Ukraine, right? Because they're, they're allowing the separatists to do it. Uh, and we've gotten to a position here where, uh, you know, Putin had to either kind of cut his losses or go further. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the literature that was written about the war in Ukraine after 2014 said basically that the way to sum it up is everybody loses. Russia was losing, Ukraine was losing, the separatists were losing. No one gained anything from the 2014 conflict. So this particular war is more like a continuation play in which Putin decided to gamble. Uh, he, he thought the West was divided, uh, he thought NATO was divided, he thought various individual leaders were weak. Mm -hmm. And think what he did to, to Macron. He brought the French, mm -hmm. you know, president in and tried to make him look like a fool by yeah. sitting him at a long table and, and gauge whether, how weak yeah. he truly was. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think he firmly believed um, some of their own lies about, about Ukraine mm -hmm. and that Zelensky was weak and the Ukrainian people were weak and, and so on. So, the, you know, this particular war you know, was an attempt to continue to dominate Ukraine in a, in a way that Russia has tried to dominate its neighbors uh, since 2000. So it, it, it had just been part of a predictable pattern. Mm. Uh, I think, though, that it was the miscalculation of the response of the West that really, you know, is yeah. what has led to such a, such, such a, a large conflict here. Steve, I want to mention, yeah, sure. Neil's written a book that just <laughs> published a year ago that basically on this, you know, learning from Russia's wars. What, uh, what, when, where, and why Russia will strike next. So yes. he was not surprised that this yeah. happened. Um, I, I guess I should mention some, some mm -hmm. basic historical things too, though, sure. that, you know, Russians and Ukrainians are different identities, different nationalities, mm -hmm. but because Ukraine was part of the 
late Russian Empire and part of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of Russification there, so Ukrainians speak Russian, mm -hmm. and um, you know it was traditionally thought of as the breadbasket of the right. Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, but you know we know there there are different nations, different identities, right? Mm -hmm. But I think in Putin's mind and in some of the, the people around him, there's this belief that, well, you've probably heard that, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union was this terrible thing for Russia. And, and I think his mind is more, let's restore the sort of grandeur of Russia back in the, the days of the Tsar and the, you know, the Russian mm -hmm. Empire. And that Ukraine and Belarus, to some Order. extent, are real central to that, in addition to the strategic part about being a buffer state. And so I think that's part of the motivation for this aggressive war. Um, the other thing I'll just throw out is that the Crimea historically was actually more Russian than Ukrainian. That Stal wow. Stal or Khrushchev gave that to Ukraine mm -hmm. kind of to compensate them for Stalin's horrible genocidal famines mm -hmm. that he generated in Ukraine. By, that was the Soviet Union trying to get Ukraine integrated into the Soviet Union, right? And, so there's a lot of history here sure. and a lot of problems, but you know there is that imperialistic desire, I think, to rebuild the power and stature of Russia yeah. that's driving yeah. it. And, and Ellen, as, as we talked about this, obviously the message that we're seeing in, from all different perspectives, but uh, Putin portrays himself as the savior of Russia. Um, he's trying to, and, and uh, as you gentlemen have said, uh, he believes the people in Ukraine, or at least in his mind, are Russian, so they should be part of Russia. So talk a little bit about the messaging we've seen so far. And obviously there's a lot we can talk about there oh, the as we go along. the layers of the onion, yeah, I yeah. could go on for hours. But mm -hmm. to kind of recap briefly, you know, um, the latest data I've looked at in terms of polling was from about um, mid-March. So it's about two weeks old, um, so I'm not sure if it's ticked up or down since then. but. You know, the, the main important thing to remember is that most Russians are behind this. Mm -hmm. Most Russians perceive Ukraine as part of Ukraine, just as mm -hmm. most Americans see Texas as part right. of America oh, rather okay. than as part of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, so um, now that's not withstanding in terms of they're removing their final independent media instituting mm -hmm. draconian laws to prevent journalists from even mentioning the word war with regard to Ukraine. Ukraine. Wow. Um, so there's a lot of, of gap and lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but you know the majority of Russians as of right now are, are quite behind mm. um, what they understand to be sort of a, a minor uh, administrative matter similar to the U.S. say dealing with immigration on the border whenever there are periodic surges. Mm -hmm. um, so it's um, I in terms of the media portrayals in the West uh, s over grossly oversimplifying the message down to Putin it's really incorrect. Um, okay. The majority of Russians at least as of the latest data I've looked mm -hmm. at are, are really still behind it. Now, would they be as um, enthusiastic were they to be more aware of what's actually going on objectively? There are you know, um, upticks in terms of hundreds of thousands of um, uh, VPNs, um, virtual private networks showing at least younger R Russians, Gen X, Gen Z, are trying to get more real knowledge about what's going on, but that's the min minority. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really hard to say. Yeah. It's, um, well, and, and, and we come back, we can talk more about it because, yeah, what what we view, at least I think probably most Americans view, is, is what you're saying is like the average Russian, if there is such a thing as an average Russian, just right. like you know, of average American, they're seeing, as you're indicating, a totally different view of what, even from this, this the, the actual impact is very small. We're look, they look at it, as you said, almost like a border situation where we see it as a global, strategic, world-shaking, maybe the start of World War III thing. So we come back, let's, let's talk a little about that. And of course, more of the historical pr perspective too, because as you said, there's a lot of layers to this to get to. Uh, back in just a moment, we're talking uh, with some BGSU faculty about Ukraine, Dr. Mark Simone, Dr. Neil Jesse, and Dr. Ellen Cervinsky. So back in just a moment, here on The Journal. 
Thank you for staying with us here on The Journal. Uh, our guests are Dr. Ellen Gorsevsky from the School of Media and Communications here at Bowling Green State University and two members of the faculty at the, uh, the Department of Political Science, uh, Dr. Mark Simone and Dr. Neil Jesse. Uh, obviously, as we talked about, huge, huge issue, a lot of things we, we can't spend as much time on, but uh, Dr. Simone, the West reaction has been in some ways very united, but then occasionally not as united. So talk a little about the West reaction and, and how that has proceeded uh, as we have now a month into this. So I think Neil was right that uh, Putin really underestimated the West mm -hmm. for good reason, because there's been a lot of tension in NATO in the last five mm -hmm. years, right? But the thing about this is, you know, the narrative that the Russian people who watch state media believe that Ellen talked about mm -hmm. is one thing. The narrative that the West sees is another, and it's based on mm. the, the echoes that this has of historical precedent from World War II. And, and also, I think the, the, the primary rule in international politics since the founding of the UN is it, you do not take over other countries by force. Right. That is mm -hmm. like the foundational goal of the UN uh, to enforce that rule so that we do not have World War III. Mm. Right. And Russia just so blatantly mm -hmm. violates that in, in right. you know, mm -hmm. in contrast to the Crimea's takeover in 2014, where they kind of snuck in, send the little green men, and, you know, mm -hmm. before you know it, there's a referendum. This is just a flat out invasion. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just so outlandish that it mm -hmm. drove NATO to realize this has been our purpose all along, is to resist this exact thing. Mm -hmm. And so the reaction in Europe has been stronger than anyone expected, really, in terms of not just supporting economic sanctions, but you know, taking on the kinds of uh, costs by risking you know, cut off of their oil and gas, mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, it's really serious. And the Europeans are united against this because people remember World War II. And they remember the Soviets invading Czechoslovakia and Poland and Hungary and all of those things. And this is, it's just too strong an echo. Mm -hmm. Now, a, a, a question, I mean, in Putin's mind, and I know we're not in Putin's mind, obviously, is there any legitimacy at all to his concern? Because his, one of his topics has been, I'm I want to have a buffer around Russia's borders. And he sees Ukraine as that. Uh, and, but then you've got Poland, which is now a member of NATO, literally on his border. You've got the Baltic states, which are NATO states, literally on his border. So is that even remotely a legitimate concern that, hey, I don't want a NATO country right on my border? I mean, is there any legitimacy at all? I mean, in, from, I suppose from his perspective, there from is. From his but, perspective, but there is. Yeah, but, but um, you know, yeah. it's, well, maybe, Neil, you could talk about mm -hmm. the Russian mentality here, about mm -hmm. the kind of, well, well yeah. every, and Dr. Simone's correct, every nation has a right mm -hmm. to its security. Right. And most nations believe the security is enhanced if they have friendly neighbors near them or as a buffer mm -hmm. against other states. Um, the difficulty here is that you can't create buffers by invading them. And, mm -hmm. and that's the part that is not legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, we, it, John Mersheimer is one of our top political scientists, does your national mm -hmm. relations. And one of the things that he's put out in the media now is that the West was to blame for this by moving NATO so close to Russia. Mm -hmm. okay. And un unfortunately, that's, that's incorrect. What he's mm -hmm. failing to note is that if we had not moved NATO so close to Russia, Russia would be invading countries further west by now. And, mm -hmm. and, and so it, it's actually, you know, moving NATO closer is what is allowing the West to respond to this invasion right. of Ukraine. It's, as, as Dr. Simone has said, you know, the basic nature of, of, of our international system is, is that states are, should not have their sovereignty violated by other states. Right. Uh, and so there's no legitimacy to Russia's violation here, okay. uh, despite what the Russian government is saying. Yeah. Um, I mean, so. it, it almost, I mean, from the surface and, and perception-wise, and Ellen, you could probably speak to this, if you look at that, it's almost like he's trying to restore the Iron Curtain, that buffer of having other basically vassal states that are beholden to Russia between him and NATO, between him and the West. Um, and the messaging is like that. As you said, th that's some of the messaging we're hearing, not just from Russian media, but even from some Western media. Well, maybe he does have a reason. He's, he has a reason to do this. So yeah, talk a little bit about that. Right, yeah. so um, f 
from the Western European perspective, um, particularly France, Germany, mm -hmm. Macron was very, very involved in taking many trips and trying to negotiate mm -hmm. um, and figure out a way to get to a ceasefire. Um, and um, you know the European Union likewise, but there was a lot of disorganization and disagreement primarily with mm. regard to you know, finally once the conflict had begun, um, implementing some low grade uh, restrictions um, in terms of economic um, boycotts and um, you know, uh, freezing of assets and so forth. Um, the U.S. was very slow to do that, um, mm -hmm. and so uh, the Europeans, particularly the Germans, still, as of this date, as far as I know, I checked the news, you know, uh, I haven't seen mm -hmm. any movement on that in terms of blocking the oil and gas mm -hmm. uh, from Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, just on Sunday, the, over the, this past weekend, um, Zelensky again appeared before uh, the Doha Forum in mm -hmm. Qatar, and um, he said, you know, please increase your production so that Germany mm. can uh, be able to do this. Can, yes. And when mm. he appeared before the Bundestag, he asked, you know, Germany to please do that, um, asking also repeatedly um, the British Parliament when he appeared um, and sort of cribbed from Churchill's yeah. uh, famous <laughs> speech. Um, I'd give him a B plus. Well, you know? if you're, you're going to steal, steal from <laughs> yeah. the best, you he know. Cited that's, his source, that so yeah. you know, the, the, I think the British seem mm -hmm. charmed. Likewise, when mm -hmm. he appeared before the U.S. Congress, um, there were members of Congress who were very moved, um, mm -hmm. almost to tears, sure. mm -hmm. um, when you know he kind of mentioned the parallels for the U.S. between. Uh, Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. and um, the attacks on Ukraine. I, I, I see less of a parallel, but rhetorically, it was very persuasive. Um, he's got movie star quality. He was a television actor. Mm -hmm. He appeared on Ukraine's equivalent of Dancing with the Stars. Ah. Um, mm -hmm. He's very media savvy. So um, Zelensky comes across as a very personable, persuasive figure. He's very down to earth in his self portrayal. He wears sort of MASH style, right, you know, yeah, army okay, yeah. green mm -hmm. um, polar fleece or just a simple army t shirt. Mm -hmm. um, he's shown in the trenches, whereas um, stark contrast, Putin appears before these incredibly, ridiculously long tables, appearing very out of touch, mm -hmm. reportedly. Um, I saw a 60 Minutes uh, broadcast where they said he had replaced a thousand of his personal mm. um, employees in his house because he's so paranoid about being um, poisoned. Mm -hmm. um, so that so he appears, rightly or wrongly, you know, his self portrayal is very distanced. The only exception was when he had sort of a Trump-esque rally where he gave a speech mm. and he was yeah. wearing kind of a. A, yeah, like a, you know, a big puffy coat, and he looked yeah. maybe slightly mm -hmm. less right. out of touch, um, but it also appeared more to be sort of like a North Korean style um, yeah, yeah, or yeah, Soviet yeah. era rally that, mm -hmm. that was full of people who were paid to be there kind of thing. So, um, so the optics for Zelensky versus Putin in terms of their leadership to the mm -hmm. West, you know, we, we love mm -hmm. Zelensky because he's just so, um, uh, telegenic and yeah. is able to get his message across. I don't know what my yeah. colleagues w would say yeah. in terms well, of his ability well, to yeah. persuade, well, but he's, gonna he's been we'll quite we'll persuasive. Let's, yeah, let's come back to that because it is the, as we know, messaging the what people see and, and perceive is, is really, unfortunately, somewhat at the core of all this. So uh, back in just a moment, we're talking about the Ukraine with uh, BGSU faculty members, Dr. Mark Simone, Dr. Neil Jesse, and Dr. Ellen Gorsevsky. Back in just a moment on The Journal. Thanks for staying with us on the journal. We're talking about Ukraine, and of course, obviously, this is not a topic you can cover in, in 25 minutes. When we get right down to the bottom of it, what is the ultimate goal that Putin is trying to accomplish here? What, what is his main yeah. thrust here? And I, I want to be clear about this. You know, I mean, I, he has an imperial vision of restoring Russia to its former glory, and that's not uncommon for states like this that have experienced loss. But, Unfortunately, he's really fitting a lot of the stereotypes that we saw in World War II. Mm. Um, mm. He's a bully, and he's, he's leading a country that's promoting authoritarianism and the authoritarian model, and he's trying to spread it. Mm. 
And I think that's partly his downfall. I want to ask Neil mm -hmm. about, you know, we've seen the Ukrainian military do much better than expected and the Russian military that was so feared in the Cold War do so poorly. What do you think is happening there on the ground and what's the likely outcome? Well, I mean, the war is going very poorly for Russia right now. Um, when, and this, even though it was unexpected from the West that the Russian military would do this poorly, when you examine how they performed uh, over the last couple of decades in their wars, uh, we should have seen this coming. Uh, when they fought in Georgia, they, they did kind of a post-mortem as to why their troops did not perform well. And they found that about 70% of them were not combat ready the time they were sent into Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, and if Georgia had not been so small, Russia would have lost that war. What we're seeing here is that there's a lot of corruption inside of Russia. You know, it yeah. runs like a kleptocracy uh, in which people at the top steal. This uh, has created uh, you know, a military that has low morale uh, and is very inefficient. Uh, and I think we're seeing that now, that, that while Russia might be very good at, at long range bombardment and, and leveling cities uh, to the ground, uh, their troops don't fight well. And, and, and I would anticipate, and I hate making any sort of predictions, but the, the, the Russian military is gonna go on the defensive now uh, rather than the offensive here in Ukraine. Uh, and, and, you know, we can see that much like the Russian state, as Dr. Simone has been talking about, and as Ellen's been mentioning about the Russian population, mm -hmm. it, the Russian state is a bit weaker than it looks. You know, these mm -hmm. sort of autocratic societies like to portray strength, but because of endemic corruption, uh, they're, they're weak at their core. And this you know? is an important yeah. point because, you know, on the ground, Russia's losing a lot of artillery and tanks, and they have troops defecting and things. And while they have numbers, this can switch quickly. And I, I wonder about two possibilities. One is, what happens if Russia really starts losing? Uh, it's the same thing about what happens if Russia really starts winning or becoming more aggressive. Mm -hmm. This is why NATO is trying desperately not to get into a no-fly zone uh -huh. or have any conflict because we it don't- hopes it'll flame out on mm -hmm. its own. Mm -hmm. Well, no, but NATO. if, if well, we yeah. get into a conflict with Russia, in any NATO country's attack, we're obligated to defend them. Right. Mm -hmm. That raises five. Two, mm -hmm. two nuclear armed states. And Putin has been very vocal about his willingness to use nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I think as a strategy to scare mm -hmm. off the West, oh, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, which I agree. is you know, effective, but let's be honest, it's possible that we'll see the first use of nuclear weapon in warfare since World well, War II. Well, this, yeah. uh, I mean, another possibility here now is, is with Russia redefining some of its goals as being merely the liberation of the Donbass region right. and, okay. and continuation mm -hmm. of the occupation of Crimea, that we, we could see this go back to where it was in 2014, which is not a long-term solution, mm -hmm. um, but might be one that would lower the tension. Uh, uh, they've changed something. their messaging in recent okay. days yeah. um, to indicate mm -hmm. that you know, they're the they're you never nearing. Really wanted all you know, of Ukraine I have, really, but right. Yeah, I have okay. in mind the George W. Mm -hmm. Bush with the mission accomplished mm -hmm. kind of okay. um, yeah. parallel on the um, victory and then on the carrier. Yeah. So, so let's, let's hope that happens. That would be my fear was the lesser of, of many possible frightening scenarios. Mm -hmm. My fear is that Putin was so out of touch that he would just decide to go for broke go, and go and, all out and well and, and escalate and, and then push. It, by accident, missiles mm -hmm. could land in Poland, and then where are we, right? Mm -hmm. And this is mm -hmm. this is really serious, and they've got a strategy to use nuclear weapons in a limited way. How would the West respond? Yeah, yeah and, we, and we've got just to like a minute or so, so whatever, whoever wants to get the last word, yeah. Yeah, Neil, yeah. Well, well, you know, yeah. uh, or more the expert yeah, or, in this region. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's the thing is one of the, you know, you hate to say something positive might be happening right now uh, in mm -hmm. this war, but the fact that it could potentially become more limited and not continue to expand mm -hmm. might be might be at least a temporarily positive outcome here. Okay. Um, and and you know, it, it did appear that Putin had very grand goals when he went into this, but I think the realization a of his military's ineptitude at, at arriving at those goals, and b the massive pain that that the West has put on yeah. Russia because. You know, to summarize, he's gotten the opposite of what he wanted. NATO is unified. He's in a war he can't win. Uh, Ukraine will be, and the Ukrainian people will be against him for a very long time, and against Russia, Russians for a very long time here. This is the opposite of what he wanted when he went in. So, you know, I think by now he is starting to realize, or at least people are making him realize inside Russia. Um, you know, some of his Siloviki and others that are with him are, are probably telling him it's, it might be time to cut our losses here. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, although there are also, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, uh, close to six million internally displaced Ukrainians and close to four million people dispersed across Europe now, um, right. particularly in Poland. So it's, it could have a very destabilizing mm -hmm. um, sure. influence in Europe right now, too. So. Yeah. Uh, it remains to be seen, to be continued. Yeah, well, and, and, and I'll have, we'll have to leave it there, but I, I know someone said, well, if this is Russia losing, I don't want to see Russia winning, because you see those on, on TV, you see the destruction of Ukraine, mm -hmm. and you're thinking, wow, if this is them losing, what's it going to look like if they actually win? What does that mean? Well, it just encourages them to do more, as you said. Mm -hmm. They'll continue to move. So we'll, we'll have to leave it right there. Uh, uh, Dr. Mark Simone, Dr. Neil Jesse, Dr. Ellen Gorsevsky, thank you for being here to talk about Ukraine. Uh, maybe we can have you guys back in a few weeks. Maybe we won't have anything to talk about by Ukraine. By then, everything will we'll get whatever, whatever, whatever the best scenario <laughs> is there we'll have. We'll hope that's the case. Uh, you can check us out at WBGU.org. And of course, you can watch us each week on The Journal. We'll see you again next time. Good night and good luck.